Good morning, Anthony. Today we'll be discussing the interesting organ, the kidney. Look forward to it. Yes, well, the big question of the kidney, one of the most important um, organs in the in the vertebrate body is what is it for? And okay. um, believe it or not, this question has not been answered. Um, this is like one of those <laughs> one of those anomalies of, of biology that's so big that it's actually hard to wrap one's head around. I mean, you would think that um, the function, the basic function of the kidney would have been understood uh, decades, if not centuries ago. Yeah. And, um, and yet this is not true. Um, none of the textbook accounts of the kidney give even a halfway decent explanation of what the kidneys are for. Um, they do state that the kidney is, uh, is, is concerned with excretion and homeostasis, but the excretory part makes no sense in terms of the energy um, use of the kidney, which is far greater than could ever be explained by excretion. And the homeostasis angle is far too vague to make any kind of real sense. Um, okay. how, does it, how does it keep homeostasis? Well, if they're implying that it's just a matter of keeping the right concentrations of various solutions in the body, well, again, that, that's a worthwhile function. But the kidney um, only weighs about half a kilogram in the human body, um, and yet it uses 10% of all of the energy that you eat. And so, um, you know, on a, on a pro mass basis, it's about 20 times more expensive than it should be. If it, if it was just doing, you know, average metabolic functions in your body. And um, why would, why would excretion not be energy intensive? Well, excretion um, is, is um, similar to secretion. Um, what, you, what happens is that certain cells, usually in glands, are capable of either making or extracting certain substances from the blood. And then, you know, ex uh, pumping them out to the, to the uh, area beyond that gland. And, yeah. and we know that glands are not particularly expensive because none of the glands really have um, particularly large blood supplies or run particularly hot or have particular mitochondrial activity. Glands are, you know, they're, they're metabolic, but they're not, there's nothing in, in the literature on glands that indicates that glands are exorbitantly energy expensive in the way that the kidney is. The kidney is as yeah. expensive as the heart. So if you look at the, yeah. um, and if you take a, a human being and put them into what physiologists call um, resting metabolic rate, yeah. a person who's quiet, unexcited, stationary, you know, uh, alive, but not, not kicking, as it were. And then you measure the <laughs> metabolic rate of the kidney. It's exactly yeah. the same on a per gram basis to that of the heart. The difference is that the heart is pumping even when you're resting, 72 strokes per minute. It's an actual muscle that's pumping away using energy in the most obvious way. The kidney is yeah. not doing anything like that. It's not even squirting urine into the ureters. It's just sitting there, as it were. And yet it is... Um, it is commandeering 10% of your body's energy, and um, it's using as much energy on a second-by-second -second basis per gram or per cell as the heart yeah. is. So what is it doing with that energy? In the heart, there's no big mystery. It's, it's doing mechanical, pumpy-type things. What is the kidney doing? That's the mystery. And that mystery, um, you, you would never even know that that mystery exists if you were to read the Wikipedia or the, um, the encyclopedic or, or um, textbook versions of the kidney. Yeah, and if you were to ask a, a doctor who specializes in understanding the kidney, um, they they presumably would say, well, taking all these elements, minerals out of the blood uh, is, a, is a complex energy intensive undertaking. Um, and yes, there's well, that, they're, they're more being taken out by the kidney than, say, a normal gland. So it's doing 10 times more than what a gland, one of the glands would do. I'm just trying to imagine what their the answer would be. You know? No, I, I think that would be an answer, but it's, it's, it's so easy to debunk that um, even to begin to discuss it is already to debunk it. I mean, okay. 
for example, let's just take a, a, one of the most important um, excretory substances in the human body, which is nitrogen. You know, we yeah. eat more protein than we need. We excrete the nitrogen. That's why urine smells. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because once nitrogen is out of the body, it tends to become ammonia, which is very smelly stuff. The point is that nitrogen is supremely easy to excrete. You don't even need an organ to do it. All you need to do is to release nitrogen into the blood as a waste product in the form of ammonium. And that ammonium is so volatile, it just goes right through your skin. Now, <clears throat> our current sensory setting is that we would find that smell objectionable, but evolution could easily have changed our settings to the, to the degree that we don't find the smell of ammonium or ammonia objectionable, and we just constantly ooze it through our skin. Another supremely easy way to get, of not a, get rid of not only ammonia, which is the nitrogen excretum, but also various other excretory substances, is just to spit. Supremely easy. Your spit glands are, are secreting stuff frequently when you eat with no particular metabolic cost. Um, it could easily be arranged physiologically that when you're not eating, your salivary glands work mainly as an excretory organ and you just keep spitting. You spit nitrogen rich or, you know, the same things that come out in your urine could come out in your spit with supreme ease. And that wouldn't even account for a fraction of the metabolic cost of the kidneys. Then there's also yeah. the skin because your skin is continually sloughing and Beyond uh, the ammonia that, that might sort of volatilize out of your skin, you could also get rid of all sorts of um, excretory substances by just putting them in the epidermis and then allowing the epidermis to slough off. In fact, that is part of the excretory system as matters stand. It's yeah. just not recognized for, for how important it is because your skin is actually one of the most, one of the largest um, organs in your body. And so it has a tremendous potential for excretion. Mm -hmm. So between... Between um, and your feces, of course, you can you can excrete lots of stuff through your feces, which involves no particular additional expense. So altogether, the whole excretory agenda of the body is nothing but a rounding error in the overall metabolic cost of running a body. It's a rounding error. OK, it's easy to do and it doesn't even require you to invent an organ. That's how easy it is. So. Given that that's so, um, it leaves the, the, the main function of the kidneys almost completely unexplained. What is the homeostasis angle? Um, what well, what uh, is needed the, to Im improve the balance of the various minerals? Well, the, the homeostasis goes way beyond minerals. And you see, this is, this is where the, the whole puzzle of the kidney becomes deliciously ironic in a way is because the textbook um, explanation for the function of the kidney is actually correct. It is homeostasis. But it's put in such a vague way that the real kicker, the real meaning of what that homeostasis means is completely lost in that message. Mm -hmm. Because firstly, to say homeostasis is, is hopelessly vague. Your whole body is, of course, homeostatic. All living organisms are. It tells you nothing, really. Yeah. You know, it's just a, it's just a truism or a platitude. Um, and if, if, if one were to, to, to be pressed to ask, well, what exact kind of homeostasis is the kidney promoting? Well, most people would think in terms of um, solutions of electrolytes, um, removal of wastes, uh, this kind of thing. But that's not what it's about at all, because this is where it's, it's useful to step back and look at the difference between life and combustion. OK, both a fire and a human body are doing the same thing. They're yeah. taking fuel in the form of carbohydrate, CHO molecules. And they're taking oxygen from the air and they are producing energy while releasing two waste products, water and carbon dioxide. A fire and you are exactly the same chemical transaction, ultimately, you know, yeah. if you stand right back. It's the, it's, it's the, shall we say, the oxidation of fuel, right? The difference yeah. is that fire is an uncontrolled and destructive process. Whereas your body is doing the same thing in a controlled way using enzymes. Now, the problem is that even with that enzymatic control and that supreme um, management of the oxidative process so that it doesn't actually burst into flames, nonetheless, there's a tremendous amount of potential chaos in the electrons. And we know about this because there's a whole science of oxidation, antioxidants, free radicals, this kind yeah. of thing manifesting in cancer and inflammation and a whole, you could write textbooks about the whole topic of how 
electro electrons can get out of hand and go berserk in the body, producing yeah. mayhem. Yeah. And it manifests also at the level of the molecule because part of the reason why your enzymes don't last very long is that they get worn out by all this electronic jiggery pokery that goes around on in, in, in terms of managing the, um, the electron transmutations in the body. Because all of the stuff we're talking about, whether it's in a fire or in a human body, is all about electron management. Because metabolism and fire are both um, processes in which oxidation and reduction occur together. And all those oxidation and reduction processes are nothing but electrons moving around from one place to another, right? So this is the idea of the kidney um, that I suggest is, is that what the kidney is, is a safe space, a compartment in the body where the body can operate continually on the electronic um, chaos, managing that electronic chaos in order to maintain that particular electronic homeostasis. A, a homeostasis so subtle that you need a, a sort of smattering of, of chemical and physical knowledge to understand exactly what's going on. So what does this explain? Well, it explains, uh, for example, why the body uses urea. When you pee, there is a nitrogen excretum in your pee, but it's, it's not in the form of ammonia as much in the form of urea. And most people assume that urea is just a waste product that the body produces and then gets rid of through pee. Nothing could be further from the truth. Urea is a precious antioxidant. It takes five enzymes to produce. It is put into and taken out of the kidneys hundreds or thousands of times before a given molecule is excreted. And it's, in the case of um, ruminant animals, it's recycled into the food from the salivary glands. And so urea is a waste product in the sense that there is urea in your urine and that urea is a form of excretum containing nitrogen that goes down the drain. But that's, that's not even a, a fraction of 1% of, of the function of urea in your body. Your body makes urea in order to put it in the kidney, where as a precious antioxidant, it helps to manage that compartment in the glomeruli, where all of the um, uh, partly ruined molecules and, and errant electrons are managed so they can be pumped back out into the body in organized form. And um, th this, this process is so intensive that the entire content of your plasma, okay, so you've got a blood supply, and apart from the blood cells, you've got a liquid in your blood, and that blood plasma is the whole of the blood plasma content of your body is processed within your um, kidney glomeruli every 22 minutes. That's astounding. Wow. Yeah. Your body does not need to do that in order to excrete crap. You know, Your body doesn't <laughs> yeah. need to process your entire plasma, yeah, the entire liquid and, and soluble substance, you know, solute content of your whole body yeah. in blood form uh, once every 22 minutes in the glomeruli in your kidney. It's doing that because it's reformulating basically your entire plasma on a second by second basis in the safe space. Why is it safe? Number one is it excludes oxygen. It has to exclude the oxygen in the blood because it wants to, to be free of that confounding or you know chaos producing oxidation process. So it extracts yeah. the the plasma from the blood into the glomerulus, which is in the cortex of the kidney, then it's yeah. free from the oxygen and it can start doing repair and electronic transmutations, you know, doing the, 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 the sort of electron accounting that's necessary to keep restoring something the opposite of fire in your body. And wow. because there's no um, um, action potentials in the glomerulus, in the way that there is, for example, in the brain or in the muscles. You know, your brain and your muscles work through an, uh, an electronic imbalance called an action potential, where one side of a membrane has a positive charge and the other side has a negative charge, mediated by ions moving across the boundary, potassium often, sodium to some degree, okay? Yeah. And so your, your brain, your heart, your other muscles, they work electrically in the sense of uh, ion-mediated ele electric charges. The precious thing about the glomeruli in the kidney is there's, there's nothing like that going on. And so it's free not only of the oxygen with its oxidant corruption, you know, its fire-like influence, but also free of the um, microcharges that are normal in other parts of the body. So it's, mm. it, it's, it's free of, of everything that would get in the way of simply operating 
to repair enzymes, to um, do oxidations and reductions, to, to reformulate in a more balanced way, in a continually repairing way, the plasma yeah. and then pumping it out to the organs where those have knock-on effects and keep restoring and maintaining um, a, a kind of homeostasis that has no um, description and no adjective in current medical science. I th you could call it an oxidotransforming function, if you like. I think we can come up with a better name, but we won't be able to come up with a, a decent name until we determine to do so. We set out to do so because of a search image that's currently lacking. Does that make sense? It's an, it's an electro homeostasis, isn't it? Yes, it's an electro homeostasis, yes, I, where the term electro refers mainly to oxidation, reduction, reactions. So yeah. it's electro in the sense of electron shells around atoms and molecules. That's the yeah. kind of electro. It's electro in the yeah. same sense that fire is an electronic transmutation. Um, yeah. Because, you know, when you, when you convert carbohydrate and oxygen to carbon dioxide and water, you're basically just mucking with electrons. Electron, yeah. electron movements make chemistry, as it were. Yeah. yeah. And when, when that process is essentially uncontrolled, you get fire. It's as effective in using up the fuel, but it's not something you want to live with because fire is, by definition, anti-life. Yeah. And, and enzymes, you know, enzymes are wonderfully complex proteins that are catalytic in doing all kinds of things in the body, but they're very vulnerable mm. because you're dealing with a structure. Firstly, it's a, a protein, which is a large, uh, complex and therefore vulnerable molecule. It's also folded in immensely uh, complicated ways. And that folding, that structural um, aspect of the protein molecule is as important as its chemical composition in terms of the actual atoms in it. And then yeah. the whole catalytic function, you know, the, the enzyme itself is not transformed. The enzyme has a catalytic effect in which it promotes a metabolic reaction without actually being affected itself. But it is, it is, it is risked, it, it risks being damaged in the process because there's some poorly understood process of wear in which molecules can only be used for a limited number of times before they either get damaged or break down or get got rid of. Yeah, so yeah. coming back to urea, I suspect that each urea molecule that your body makes at some expense, at an unnecessary expense with respect to excretion, gets used maybe, I don't know, several thousand or several tens of thousands of times in various electronic um, regu regulatory processes. And then for some reason, it's regarded as expendable and goes into the actual um, urine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's expendable. Do you, what, you see the urea, not uh, all urea molecules are not the same. Uh, one that's been used a thousand times isn't as effective as a new one. I'm not sure about that. I mean, you see, we've already raised a search image for a question that would otherwise be overlooked. I mean, I just don't know enough about chemistry to know whether one molecule is less intact than another. Um, my, my limited knowledge of chemistry means that I can't give you a mechanism for that, but we do know yeah. that enzymes um, don't last very long. I mean, if, if yeah. molecules were sort of, um, if a molecule was a molecule and was a molecule, and unless it was just, you know, involved in a chemical reaction to change its molecular structure, um, then it would just remain an effective molecule. Then you have to ask yourself, why do enzymes break down? Because they obviously break down. We've, we've got lots of, of, um, of enzymatic reactions in our body, but we have to keep making enzymes. We can't just recirculate the same pool of enzymes that we had at 20 years old forever just doing the same things, which, you know, we might have been able to do given that they are catalytic. And by definition, yeah. therefore, as catalysts, catalysts don't get used up themselves. But yeah. you do need to keep going through enzymes. That's one of the main reasons why your body wears out and, and gets old and dies is because you run out of the capacity to keep recharging your enzyme bank with new enzymes, right? So yeah. just maintaining and repairing your enzymes could be one of the most important homeostatic functions of the kidney. But of course, this is all speculation because nothing like this has been studied. And the reason it hasn't been studied is because nobody has had a search image or a basic curiosity to try to balance the account, uh, the accounting problem of the kidney. 
the curiosity comes from the initial observation that the kidney is um, orders of magnitude more metabolically expensive than can be accounted for by either excretion or a simple chemical homeostasis. Yeah, and the way you're framing it, you could argue that the kidney is the most important organ in the whole body because it's controlling the combustion, controlling the fire, and that's what life is, is controlled fire. Um, yes, and in a, that, that's right. Now, you'll never get this in Western science, um, but ironically enough, um, Chinese medicine, you know, acupuncture type medicine, the medicine that uses um, reflex points and energy meridians, yeah. which is a tried and tested form of medicine, even though it has very little scientific basis. It has long been known in Chinese medicine that the kidneys are the central organs of the body. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, um, I, I'm not promoting Chinese medicine, saying whether it's better than Western medicine or anything like that. I'm sim simply saying that an ancient culture with a very sophisticated and complex medical system called yeah. Chinese medicine um, takes it for granted that the kidneys are the most important organs in the body. They are the central, not the brain, not the heart, not the liver, the, ki the kidneys. Mm. The kidneys well, basically run the body. If they're out of kilter, if their energies are ailing, if yeah. there's an energetic blockage, if there's something that needs attention there, your whole body is out of whack because you can't be healthy without healthy kidneys. So it's interesting to ponder how other organisms manage this controlling combustion, doing what the kidneys do, from single-cell microbes up to through uh, more complex multicellular animals. Let's think about worms and insects and, and then birds and, and mammals. Um, the same physiological process must be happening even in, in a single cell uh, in a microbe at some level. But where is the kidney in the microbe? Well, that's a good question. And, and right here, I, you know, you've gone beyond my um be gone beyond the scope of my thinking i haven't even begun to think about you know the menagerie of organisms and how each one has its own version of a kidney but i think one of the important principles is that the faster your metabolism mm. the more you need a kidney so i would okay. not necessarily expect um you know, something like an earthworm um to have any particular kidney i mean maybe it does i haven't investigated it but you know, the, the, the premium on those kinds of regulatory functions in a cold-blooded and slow metabolizing creature are not that great. I mean, you, yeah. but when, when you've got humans run at 37 degrees, a lot of mammals run hotter, hotter than us. I mean, animals as familiar as goats and cats and dogs, they generally run more like 38.5. Yeah. They're really hot-blooded. So when you're running at that kind of temperature, um, things get a lot more hectic electronically. And the the, the the whole matter the whole matter of balancing your electronic transmutations, you know, your your oxidations and your reductions becomes more precarious. Yeah, I remember dissecting things like leeches and grasshoppers and uh, zoology back in 1990, and being astounded at how the organs in those animals did have analogs with us humans. Um, so perhaps that's uh, something for us to delve into, to look for the kidney equivalents across the animal kingdom as an extent. I think that would be, I think that would be an absolutely fascinating topic and, and worthy of several lifetimes of study, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, starting, starting with the observation and in the human, um, when, when blood leaves your heart, going up your aorta to your body, okay, 25% yeah. of that blood. One quarter of that blood that comes out of your heart goes straight to your kidneys. Yeah. A heck of a okay. lot goes to your brain because your brain also needs a lot of blood to function. But fully a quarter of your blood supply on a second yeah. by second basis is going to and through your kidneys. So your kidneys are processing a quarter of your blood all the time. Yeah, so, so the, the blood's moving through it at one hell of a rate, huh? Well, yes, the way it works is that there's a capillary supply around the, the cortex of the kidney, which is where the glomeruli are. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's this diffusion process in which um, the plasma of the blood is extracted, um, 
transported across the cellular boundary and then into the glomerulus, which is basically a liquid sac, a microscopic liquid sac. Yeah. Uh, two two layers of cells removed from the blood. Yeah. One layer is the is the membranous wall of the glomerulus, and the other one is the membranous wall of the actual capillary. Okay, so that process happens so rapidly that your tiny little kidneys, of which the cortex, which is the outer part, is even smaller. You're talking about just a handful of grams in your body. That's yeah. so metabolically active that it's extracting the plasma out of a quarter of your blood supply all the time from birth to death. That's yeah, constant, re re reconstituting, uh, you know, your 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 entire plasma every 22 minutes. Mm, mm. When you when you understand this, the the whole excretory explanation just becomes absurd. Yeah. yeah. Ima imagine a business, uh, you know, some sort of industrial concern, where you've got yeah. various uh, uh, accounting items. You've got, you know, inputs, outputs, and. Uh, <laughs> The electricity bill, water bill, blah, blah. Imagine how small the the cleaning bill would be for a business. Yeah. I, I doubt yeah. that most factories would spend even 2% of their budget on on waste disposal or yeah. people to scrub the floors or wash. You know, it's not, It's a. It's, as I said, it's a rounding error. Excretion is a rounding error. 25% mm. of your blood and, you know, um, 20 times more metabolic cost per cell than the average is not a rounding error. It's a major <laughs> investment. <laughs> yeah, well put. <laughs> yeah, we. I, I, I want to turn that into uh, milliliters per second or, or or liters per minute to get a sense of how much plasma is moving in and out. That that'll be an easy calculation to do. We can. Yeah, and I think that's. I think that would be very worthwhile. I think I think we do need more visual. Um, uh, visual analogs, you know, make it visual yeah. so it's more because, you know, physiology, as you know, risks being a dry and obscure and abstract topic where it's very difficult to get excited because, the, you know, the whole thing is so far removed from actual visual experience. But yeah. when, you, when, yeah. you, when you think, when you actually just picture a human body and picture that, you know, how small your kidneys are, I mean, each one fits in the, mm. in the palm of your hand. Yeah. And each, each one of these things is uh, well, the two together are processing a quarter of your blood all the time. Yeah, no, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful image. And as you say, you could spend uh, many lifetimes thinking it through. And uh, yeah, I look forward to thinking about leeches again. Um, the last time I, I did that was in 1990 when I opened up their bodies. But yeah, let's let's figure out how a leech manages its combustion dive into that yes well it could be that in these <clears throat> um slow metabolizing and relatively small organisms there's just a generalized spread of antioxidant or shall we say um oxido transforming function through many or most of the cells of the body yeah because you know there's less there's less urgency yeah because there's less yeah. going on and in a plant I, you know i suspect that there's no particular emphasis on it but uh, to me, the, the the most important, the most interesting organisms in this context are the the fast metabolizing birds. Okay. Because um, passerine birds, in particular, um, have really shockingly fast metabolism, particularly the kinds of birds that fly a lot. And um, you know, I've dissected enough ostriches, for example, and and um, Tasianid birds to know that their kidney is completely different from a mammalian kidney. To find the kidneys in an ostrich, you really need to approach it completely differently because the kidney is not a discrete bean-shaped organ in the um, in the innards. It's a kind of um, complex um, pad of tissue that's pasted up against the um, the sacral skeleton. Yeah. So the ostrich has a sacral skeleton, a bit like a com rather complex ridged bony shield that forms its rump and on the inside yeah. of that on the on the uh internal side almost as if it's been like like imagine taking peanut butter and just chucking it up against a wall mm. um on on the inside of that that pelvis bone that complex uh, bony structure the kidney is kind of squished up against it mm. it's not been like at all it's like a, a tissue that's been pushed up against that bone there 
And I think okay. that's true for most most birds. They have completely different structure of kidneys from us. And the kidneys, I don't know why that is, you know, how that relates to the function, but I suspect that the kidneys in birds are even more astonishingly metabolically active than those of mammals, simply because birds are, number one, you know, they run hotter. Many birds yeah. run at about 40 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, that's normal for birds to run closer to 40 degrees than to our 37. And because birds have these uh, bursts of energy. I mean, anybody yeah. who's watched a dove take off or a duck take off, there's a tremendous burst of energy that mammals never really achieve. And yeah. in those periods of intense metabolic activity, again, there must be a tremendous, um, you know, rush of of, of substances or, or um, yes, yeah, substances that risk interfering with the electronic balance. Yeah, it's a bit like a, a rocket taking off. Yes. You need quite an explosion of. Yes, which, which is another way of saying that. Although I acknowledge what you say about looking at a leech or something like that and going through the whole yeah. uh, zoological inventory to see just how everything manages their electrons, I would I would begin with the birds because I think that that's where the more, um, okay. I don't know, the more, the more valuable insights would be gained is to see how the, the hottest and most metabolic creatures manage this thing. In fact, I, I think that would be very instructive with mm. respect to the kidney. I think the best way... If I if I were given you know to wave a wand and given an unlimited research grant, and told yeah. that I cannot work on humans, but I can work on some other organism in order to inform my thinking on the human kidney, I think yeah. I'd go straight to the most metabolically active bird I could find. Hummingbird. Maybe yeah, maybe a hummingbird. That's a good a good one. Yeah yeah. 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 I, I'm not sure if hummingbirds. You see, hummingbirds, they're tremendously active when they fly, but they're also, because they're non-passerines, they have a, a capacity for really downscaling their metabolism when they're not flying. Yeah, so they I'm not, can go I'm, to torpor, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that hummingbirds are overall the most metabolically active birds, but, you know, maybe sunbirds or sparrows or, you know, starlings or, or just birds that fly a lot and run hot yeah. fairly consistently without any torpor. Yeah, a, a willow warbler is just moving through those acacia trees all the time. Uh, yes, and many warblers perpetual. migrate intercontinentally. You know, a little tiny yeah. what? It's sometimes a ten gram warbler. Yeah, you know, can can migrate intercontinentally, which is mind boggling if you think about it. That little <laughs> engine, yeah. you know, a little drone of only ten kilos flying from one continent to another, and then when it's ten in the grams. new continent, well, grams. something like that. Yeah, yeah. ten yeah. grams. Yeah. And then when it gets to the continent, it's frenetically active, breeding and jumping around yeah. and flying. And, you know, that, yeah. that creature is, is it's a, it, you know, it's very close to a fire in terms of its fiery intensity of life. Yeah. Okay, that's a search image. Where, where are the warblers' kidneys and how much energy are they using <laughs> relative, <laughs> relative to the brain and the heart? Great. So if... Yeah. Perhaps a, a, a final question, because we need to wrap up. Um, is there anything that you're hypothesizing here that mainstream Western medicine would take exception to? Uh, because I think probably not. The, you know, the, the, wouldn't, wouldn't the textbook say, yes, you know, the kidneys dealing with the electromagnetic issues and oxidation reduction reactions and uh, is providing some sort of electro homeostasis. Um, they, they wouldn't argue with that, or would they? I, well, uh, I think an important aspect of this is that um, much of current knowledge, much of, you know, um, generally accepted wisdom has a traditional basis to it. Yeah. Um, science, including medicine, are only partly about rationality and empiricism. They're also partly about tradition and authority. And I think um, part of the the part of the reason why a more sober and realistic approach has not been taken to the kidneys is because there's two fields of medicine that have not caught up with each other. The, the, the people concerned are not speaking to each other. One is the old field of renology, yeah. okay? 
that's an established field. It's a tremendously interesting and detailed field, and rhinologists are, of course, tremendous experts in their ren rhinological field. But there's also a newer field, which is basically the whole field of medicine that deals with free radicals and oxidation, yeah. inflammation, oxidant risk, etc. right? The, the latter is much more exciting because it's, it's newer and in a way more subtle because it's at the molecular level instead of at the macroscopic level as rhinology is. But what's wrong with this picture is not only that, that um, human biologists, medicos and so on, are not hypothesizing at the, at the sort of gross level that you and I are, but it's also that the two fields have not spoken to each other. If you were to get a, a conference combining the world's best rhinologists, with the world's best antioxidant medicos. Yeah. And you basically said, we're not letting you out of here until you solve the problem of the kidney. I think it could be solved in a fortnight. But yeah. it, it, the question is, is there any incentive? Is there any professional incentive for these people even to talk to each other? Usually not, because the way it works is that if you're an authority in your field, and if you respect the usual trend towards reductionism, there's no real incentive for you to become even slightly um, multidisciplinary. Mm. And then, of course, the easy thing is just to keep on pretending that we understand the kidney, and so there's nothing to be answered, really. You know? But the, the tragedy of that is that one of the most fascinating um, aspects of, of biology is, is being underplayed. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, this is it's an a example. Huge, it's a huge question. Uh, the amount of energy it uses, the amount of plasma going through it, so it's just uh, delicious. Well, well, <laughs> for, for, listeners who, for listeners who are scratching their heads and asking, you know, how can we possibly be at the cutting edge of thinking about what the kidneys do for a living, I'd, I'd, simply, I'd simply point out that as far as I've seen, um, there's nothing in the literature uh, that has ever pointed out uh, this as an anomaly. Yeah. Okay. It's not like it's a neglected anomaly. You know, it's not like people have pointed out that it's a puzzle and they haven't got around to, to, to working it out. Correct me if I'm wrong, listeners, um, but, but go, go to the literature and find me a single publication that has ever said, well, there's some puzzle to be solved in terms of the mismatch between the rather trivial excretory function of the kidney on the one hand and the mind-boggling energetic uh, demands of the kidney. When, when, you, when, you, when you're not a medico and you just look at the gross facts, that anomaly springs out immediately like an elephant in the room. But, but it's apparently not noticed by rhinologists, physiologists, doctors. Um, it doesn't seem to have registered as, as an anomaly. Why that is yeah. so, well, bigger, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's not necessary to understand that in order to perform kidney transplants and get the kidney working again. Um, and, and perhaps most funding in medicine is channeled towards, uh, yeah, working out how to fix a damaged kidney as opposed to understanding wh why it uses so much energy. Well, I, I hear you, but you know, again, there's a, an incongruity um, if you look at neurology. Mm. Um, studies of, of the nerves, the brain, the nervous system, um, down to great detail, are, are very much in vogue. And you could make exactly the same argument. You could make the argument for, for pragmatic medical purposes. You don't really need to know in great detail how your brain or your nerves work. Yeah. And yet, and yet brain science um, has exploded so much in the last few decades, you can't even keep up with it. Mm. You know, mm. people have invested ungodly amounts of energy and time and money into understanding how the nerves and the brain works. I'm not sure how productive that's been, but certainly yeah. people have put whole careers, whole institutions into it as if it yeah. matters. And again, it's the disparity that's interesting yeah. because I wouldn't like to choose whether to have a brain or a kidney, but um, you could certainly argue that your kidneys are a prerequisite to having a brain, whereas the opposite is not necessarily true. You know, you could have somebody yeah. who's comatose, who's, who's something close to brain dead and their kidneys could be still functioning fairly well. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're you know, creating rather fanciful um, um, uh, thought experiments here. But, yeah. but I could argue that the, the kidneys are more basic to life than the brain is. 
Well, yeah. let me give you a better example. You could have imagine an organism that has kidneys as powerful as ours, but has a fraction of our brain size, like an ostrich. An ostrich yeah. has a tiny little brain. There's not much cognition going on there. Its kidneys yeah. are even more powerful than ours. And so it's easy to find animals that are very kidney intensive, but not very brain intensive at all. Human beings happen to be very brain intensive, but more basic to our nature is the kidney. Yeah. So just, just that, that incongruity alone is food for thought. Why is it that brain science and neurology, neurobiology, have become um, extremely in vogue, extremely well attended, extremely well funded, extremely prestigious, burgeoning at such a rate that even a specialist can't keep up with the literature, whereas our understanding of the kidney is still basically 1800s, 19th century level. That, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's, the interesting, that's the interesting anomaly. I think we're trying to understand ourselves and we see ourselves being our brains. Yes, that, that, that is, that is a, a good part of it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. But the, yeah. the kidneys are a platform and perhaps greater understanding would come from first tackling the kidney. Well, now that, now that you mention it, it's almost, like, um, it's almost like an opposite in the sense that the kidneys are infradig. I mean, your yeah. brain is like at the top of your head it's it's the idea of intelligence um your yeah. brain is a very uh it's 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 got high status in your conception yeah. of yourself whereas your yeah. kidneys are what you pee through you know i mean <laughs> <Yeah>. basically <laughs> so it's very infra dig in the sense of of a general conception of of how to be a human and yeah. i'm sure that's not a conscious thing but subconsciously it must affect people's predilections for Focusing on a certain organ system. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Anthony. Uh, look forward to perhaps another episode where we can talk about how hummingbirds versus warblers versus earthworms um, manage their oxidation status. And uh, that's been fascinating. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Well, uh, thank you. And, and uh, to listeners, please like, subscribe and share. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next podcast here on Exploring the BioEdge. So uh, over and out for now. Cheers. Cheers.